This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Thank you, God, for this day. I pray, God, you'd be with this meeting. I pray, God, you'd be with uh, the preaching and help us, Lord, to get something from your word. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from thy love. In Jesus' name, amen. The next topic that we're dealing with in our uh, study on then, a Christian then must be, a Christian then must be, we're taking, uh, again, the qualifications of a bishop, and we're aligning them to things throughout the Bible that the Bible is clear are characteristics and qualities and qualifications, if you would, for all Christians. Uh, I think the important thing of this, and I've been guilty of it myself, is that quite often when you're sitting back in the pew, when you're sitting back in the chairs and you're looking up at the man of God, you, you tend to make tears for yourself, right? That, that, that somehow the past... or. Uh, you know, the, uh, the deacon must be holier, or than the, and the pastor must be holier than him, and even holier than him, and it just keeps going and going and going. But you set yourself way down below and actually, essentially get rid of any responsibility that you yourself have. But the reality is, is that a Christian has the responsibility to keep all of these same qualities and qualifications in their own life. Um, otherwise, we end up being hypocritical in judgment. We end up having, you know, the great big blameless beam in our eye while we're trying to accuse our leadership of certain things. You know, we may be covetous. We may be um, not vigilant in our Christianity. Uh, but then we're looking at our leadership as if as if they're failing. But the reality is, if you judge in that case, uh, you shall be judged. The Bible is clear on that. The next topic we're dealing with is not given to wine. So a Christian then must be not given to wine. Given means uh, prone to or disposed to. So not given to wine essentially means you're not prone to wine. You shouldn't be disposed to wine. Now we know that throughout the Bible there's two meanings to the word wine. We know that it's a generic term about the fruit of the vine. Um, whether that be right off of the uh, grape or whether that be uh, the fermented and heated and, and prolonged um, adding of whatever chem chemical concoction you have to do to make it into the alcoholic version. The context is always going to tell you what the Bible is talking about. As it says in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 8, it says, New wine is found in the cluster. A blessing is in it. So the new wine is found in the cluster. So we wouldn't say that when you hold up a cluster of grapes like we have at the back, that that somehow contains alcohol. We wouldn't say that you know eating of that is going to get you drunken. So we know very clearly right here that that wine that's being talked about is the juice that comes out of the grape, comes out of the cluster. And in Genesis chapter 9, and verse 21, the Bible says of Noah, it says, He drank of the wine and was drunken. So we know right away that it's talking about um, a drink that's consumed first and foremost, but one that will make you drunk and will make you intoxicated. Therefore, you see in those two simple examples, two different contexts for which the wine is used. We're not to be given to wine as Christians. I believe it's strongly pointing towards the alcoholic version of the wine, but I think there's probably also an extension of that, that just the regular everyday wine. If we were to think of the context in which the Bible was written, uh, wine or juice of any sort was very expensive, very hard to get a hold of. So if you were one that was even given to the juice of fruit, if you were one that was given to that type of wine, you'd find yourself in trouble because it becomes in a very expensive habit. It becomes something, well, in the Bible times, that only the rich, only the wealthy would essentially have great quantities of it. Uh, we consider it, you know, a, a great, you know, everywhere. It's available everywhere. You can go to the store and you can just buy juice. But there, it wasn't always so in this world. It used to be that it would be stomped by foot. Uh, there was a great amount of work that had to go into it. It had to be basically served fresh every time. There was a great cost to it. And therefore, only kings drank of the wine off of the vine quite often because uh, of the short shelf life, the high cost of production, all that sort of things. But <clears throat> again, I think not given to wine is talking more so rather to the alcoholic 
version of wine. And, and, and indeed, Christians ought not be given to it. Look in Proverbs in chapter 23. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, in verse 29, the Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. Doesn't this sound appealing? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to sink, seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, and as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. So we see there, in regard to the alcoholic wine, we see that it is addictive. He's going to awake from all of this that's come upon him and seek it again. Now who wants to wake up with, with uh, red eyes, with woe, with sorrow, with contention, with babbling, and then seek it again? The reality is that's like 90% of our population. Many people just drink alcoholic wine, drink beer, liquor, drink any kind of alcohol, they do it to get drunk and then they feel all these adverse effects, even ruining their own lives. Like it says in verse 33, that I shall behold strange women and thine heart shall seek after perverse things. And, and if anybody spent any time in the world, they know that, that, that wine and alcohol does that to a person, it makes them do and say and think and feel perverse things. And behold strange things and, and do all sorts of ungodliness and wickedness. It ought not so to be among Christians. It definitely ought not so to be to get wrapped up into this kind of uh, prolonged and, and repeated behavior where, whereby you're, you're, you're prone to it. You're given to wine. You're disposed to it. It becomes something that even though it affects you, even though it hurts you, even though it harms you and ruins your life, something that you'll seek again just like it does in the context of Proverbs 23 here. Look over in Proverbs 31. In Proverbs 31, a few pages, the Bible says that wine is not for kings. Proverbs 31 and verse 4, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. I think the Bible here is almost tongue-in-cheek, you know. If your life is so miserable, if your life is so rotten, if your life is so that you're just ready to perish, and you got this heavy heart, and you know, you think of that country singer down there with his heavy heart, and he's, and he's going, whoa, my dog died, and my wife left me, and all these things. Yeah, give the wine to that loser, that guy that's ready to die. Give the wine to that guy that, that is ready to perish, that is of this heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty. The reality is, he's still poor, whether he remembers it or forgets it or not. But remember his misery no more. That's for but a time. Give that to him. But that's not for kings, O Lemuel, the Bible says. That's not for kings. Well, we might say to ourselves, hey, well, I'm not a king. Well, if you're saved, you indeed are. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 56, this is Jesus talking. He said, who shed his, who shed, or who washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto him. So we are kings and priests indeed unto God because we are saved, because we are born again. And the encouragement, the exhortation, the prophecy that came from King Lemuel's mother here is, hey, don't drink that stuff. Don't touch that stuff. You're going to pervert judgment. You're going to you're going to mess up the law. You're going to afflict somebody. You're going to you're going to you're going to screw up your life. Give it to that bum. Give it to that loser. Give it to that low life. You're a king. You're a priest unto God. Give the alcohol to those others, those, those, those people. Let them forget their misery. Let them forget their poverty. It should be different for us. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. As we like to, we're going to spin, spin through and turn to lots of Bible pages today. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 8. Leviticus 10, 8. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, do not drink wine nor strong drink. 
thou nor thy sons with thee. And remember the context here. Aaron's a priest, right? We just talked about how we are made kings and priests. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy. And between unclean and clean. And that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So here the Bible says, lest ye die. Don't drink that before you go and minister before God. Don't drink that stuff when you're serving God. Well, the Bible says that we're supposed to serve the Lord in everything we do as priests and kings in the New Testament. So, so if we're supposed to give God the glory in everything that we do when we serve Him, and if the Bible says that when the priests were to go and serve before Him, when they were to enter into the tabernacle of the congregation, they weren't to drink lest they die, how much more us, given the Holy Spirit of God within us to empower us not to do these foolish and wicked things, how much more us, us, when we're kings and priests unto God, each and every one of us who are believers and have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, how much more should we put away this junk from us? Should we get rid of alcohol? Should we not even touch that stuff lest we die? Or how about we, lest we suffer an even worse cause, an even worse fate? What, what if we were to, to just get become drunks, become losers, and now because of our sins and because of our wickedness, yeah, we die and go to heaven, but because we didn't have that impact, that purpose, that follow through that God had for us, because we ruined our lives so much, our family goes to hell. Our extended family, our friends, everybody that we were supposed to minister to. What a wicked and awful and tormentous fate to stand in heaven and see all those people that you could have ministered to and impacted to, but instead you decided to drink wine. Well, if you drink wine, if you drink strong drink, when you're ministering to God, you're a fool. You ought to die, lest you die, the Bible says. But the reality is, is yeah, we're supposed to be different. As it says here in verse 10, it says, That ye may put difference between holy and unholy. That you may put difference between unclean and clean. So that there's a distinction, so that you can properly judge. Your mind isn't clouded with booze and liquor and wine and all that disgusting stuff that the world likes to grab a hold of. But rather, you can put difference to the end that you may teach the children of Israel. To the end that you may be a great example to, to people that are following after, to children, to younger people, to younger people in the Lord, that you may do right by God. And in, in, in doing so, you may put difference between unclean and clean and teach others to do the same also. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, if you will. Turn to Ephesians 5. The Bible makes it clear, don't be drunken. Don't be drunken. But a lot of people will take that and say, well, then I can have a sip or two. I can have a, a drink. I can have a beer. I can have a wine with dinner. Not so. The Bible says don't be drunken. The Bible also commands you to be sober. But it also says that those that are drunken, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Let them sleep. The Bible says they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober. And that's the exhortation from God. That's the encouragement to Christians that we're to be sober. Yes, that means serious. Yes, that means steadfast. It also just means to not be intoxicated by that foolish stuff. And we all know, we all know if we were to be honest, if, if, if this was a part of our lives in the past, we all know that even though even though these, these hypocrite Christians and even though these liars and even though these, these dirt bins, like this thing that just came out this week, Jeff Durbin saying that, oh, booze is okay, alcohol is okay. It's a blessing from God. The reality is, is that no, because he tries to take that stance where he says, oh, just don't be drunken, which means he's going to have the social drink once in a while. We all know if we are a part of that, that it only takes that one sociable drink to take that edge off. Anyone who's been a part of that knows that, that uh, quite often people will say, you know, I got off work, I just can't wait to get that drink in me. They're going to go and they're going to have that one drink and it's almost instantaneous where that sip touches your lip and then you feel, you feel better. Well, and it just leads to more wickedness. You're going to have another and another and another, and that's the end game of it. But I, 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 I challenge you to, to push back and to fight me on the fact that as soon as you have that one drink, you are no longer sober. You are now, long, you are now teetering on the edge. You are drunk and you are affected. Your judgment has been affected. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And those that are deceived thereby are not wise. That's the reality. When people start saying, oh, one drink is okay, you've been deceived. You're not wise. 
The, the, that wine has just mocked you. And it's laughing you all the way to your early grave. It's going to destroy your life. It's going to destroy your testimony. It's going to destroy your ministry. It's going to destroy your family. It's going to take you to the depths that you have never even considered. Your life is going to be ruined if you're given to wine. And therefore, a Christian then must not be given to wine. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. <clears throat> the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. So excess uh, goes along with riotousness. It goes along with um, just um, excessiveness. It, it, it's, it's, it's taking what is normal in this level and bringing it to an excessive level. And we know that drunks are quite often in excessively loud. They're excessively obnoxious. They're excessively embarrassing to those that are around them. Drink not wine, wherein is excess. But the Bible says here, it says, but be ye filled with the Spirit. And that's the, that's the contrasting effect. And if you see that great big three-letter word in the middle, it says, but. So you're either drunk with wine or you're filled with the Spirit. They are mutually exclusive. You're one or the other. You're either, you're either a drunken fool or you're filled with the Holy Ghost. And you can't be both. You can't, you can't just walk down the middle and be a little bit filled. No, filled means filled. So either you're drunk or you're, or you're um, not filled with the Holy Ghost. Or essentially, we as Christians are to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, we ought not be given to wine. A Christian then must be not given to wine. The next topic, no striker. A Christian then must be no striker. And I've tied this in with the, uh, the statement, not a brawler. Um, <clears throat> Best I can figure, there's not a lot of, of biblical definition for this, but a striker is someone that strikes. Well, that's, that's not, not hard to uh, grasp. It's someone that strikes, but the Bible call, equates that to a quarrelsome man. Someone that's obviously and honestly and, and, and quite often caught up in quarrel. One that strikes is a striker. A brawler is, is a noisy fellow, also quarrelsome, also with that same characteristic of being caught in quarrel. The best thing that I can see just from looking at these words is that a striker is one that attacks. A striker is one that goes and makes that first attack, makes that first swing of the fist, makes that first swing of the sword, is always going and on the offensive. A striker is someone that attacks. And a brawler is someone that attracts. So they attract the striker. They attract that same kind of brawling, that same kind of quarrel. So either you're going out as a striker and you're seeking it and attacking, trying to get that first punch in, or you're a brawler and you're constantly attracting that kind of behavior to you because you're loud, because you're noisy. And that's, to me, the difference between a striker and a brawler. The brawler is that person that is just always obnoxious. The person that's always going to say something that ends up getting them into a skirmish, a fight, into an argument. Whereas the striker is just maybe a quiet person, but they're always on the prowl, always on the lookout in order to suddenly get into a fight because they're going to be the one that goes and gets into an attackful situation. The striker may go in and they may start a fight and then walk away. Whereas the brawler, once that fight gets started, they're right in there. And they're just, they're just not going to leave until, until the fight's over. There's no strength in them. And I think we've all kind of seen both characters um, in our lives, especially uh, if you grew up in public school. And you, you would see the striker and you'd see the brawler. You'd see the person that started the fight and ran away. And you see the person that didn't care what the fight was about, but they're getting in it. That's the striker and that's, that's the brawler. But they're both quarrelsome. And that's what I want to grab hold of. They're both quarrelsome. Turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And as you're turning to Titus chapter 3, <clears throat> just let me read Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 9. This is also duplicated in 25 verse 24. It says, It is better to dwell in a corner of the house stop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Remember how we said the, the brawler is one that attracts the quarrel, is one that will get into the quarrel no matter what it's about, no matter who starts it. And the Bible is talking about, uh, Solomon here is mentioning that when you're, when you're dwelling with, when you're living with a woman it is in this context, or anybody, um, when you're in close proximity with them, when they're a brawler, it is better to live far away, as far as you can away from that tight quarters. Though you have to be because you both live under the same roof, the Bible says it's better for that man, that husband, who has a brawling woman, who has a brawling wife within his house, to just get so far away from her that he's on top of the corner of the roof. 
Because that brawling mentality is the one that is essentially always seeking a skirmish to get into. The Bible calls the strange woman loud. It says that she is she's boisterous. It says that she she's constantly, just like this woman, in a brawling kind of mood. And it's better. And if this is just a character example, so we can grab a hold of what it means to be a, a striker, a brawler, or a quarrelsome person in general, it is better to just remove yourself. It's better to just live way up on the corner of the rooftop as the person with with who's not, you know, that person, who's not the brawler. It's better to get so far removed from that situation that you're just living on the corner of the house top than to face that day in, day out. Titus chapter 3 and verse 2 says, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, giving, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So the Bible says here, speak o evil of no man, and be to be no brawlers. Remember I said that the brawler was one that is a noisy fellow, constantly running their mouth, and then when the fight starts, they're just going to get into it. They're not going to. They're not going to care about what side they're on. They just want to fight. And it says here, speaking evil is related to the brawlers. But in contrast, Christians, hey, we're to be gentle. Show all meekness unto all men. That, that is wide open, that exclusive. But it says, for we ourselves also were. So this is going back to the brawler. What the brawler is like. And remember, Christians aren't to be this way. But this is what a brawler, these are the character traits that a brawler holds. It says, foolish, disobedient. Deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. So I think it's easier for us to just read over something like "Don't be a brawler" as a pastor, and then go, "Okay, yeah, you shouldn't get into that fight." But look at, but look at what what ex is exemplified when you dig a little bit deeper into the scriptures and you go and search for what that really means. We're by contrast to be gentle and meek unto all men, but the brawler. The, the one that the, the pastor, the bishop ought not be, the character trait that I believe the Christian ought not to be, is someone who is a brawler. They're foolish, disobedient, deceived. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. That, that's, a, that's a big, long rap sheet that's not becoming of a Christian. I think we can all see that pretty clearly. So I think that, that though we're supposed to be gentle and meek, the contrast here is just a list of things that are almost the epitome of being carnal. Just filling yourself with your pleasures, your lusts, being disobedient because I'm going to serve myself. Living in malice. I mean, that's just carnality at its peak. Being hateful and hating one another. Constantly on the offense. Constantly attacking. This is the highest order. It's a very high order of carnality in my opinion. This is, this is just, this is the lust of the flesh. This is flesh at its finest. We know Herodias had quarrel and would have killed John the Baptist. And that's the, that's the depths. And, that, and that's, that's the, the extent of how bad somebody who is a brawler, somebody who has quarrel, somebody who is a striker can get. To the point that you have a quarrel against somebody. And if you're filled with these characteristics, if you're a brawler, you would have killed that person. You're so upset. You would have killed that person. You're so hateful. You're so disobedient. You're so full of your own pleasures and your own lust that it gets to the point where someone like Herodias had such a quarrel with John the Baptist simply because he said it's not lawful for your husband to have you because you're already married simply because a preacher said that she would have killed him. We know that in the end she found a way to do so. That, that's, that's a striker. That's a brawler. That's a quarrelsome person. But this ought not so to be amongst Christians. This ought not so to be amongst spiritual people. Look in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And here's the contrast. Colossians chapter 3. And in verse 12. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God... Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And that's, that's the root of the Christian behavior. We're not to be quarrelsome, we're to be forgiving. We're to extend long-suffering. Our mercy ought to endure forever, even as the living God's does. We ought to be kind, humble in our mind, meek before people. We ought to 
Take anything that is wrong against us and first and foremost, seek opportunity to forgive that wrong and bless the person in return, right? The Bible even says to the point where you would forgive somebody so much that heaps coal would be put up on their head. That means that somebody did something pretty bad to you if God's willing to respond in that case. But Christians ought not to have that brawling mentality, ought not to be quarrelsome, but rather we are to be forgiving. And the Bible continues and it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, there's no peace when you're a brawler. There's no peace when you're constantly in quarrel, fighting with everything, fighting with everybody. But the peace of God is to rule in our hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and then this, and be thankful. Just be thankful. We don't need to go and brawl. We don't need to fight every fight. We don't need to get involved in every quarrel that comes across us. If we're patient and we're thankful, hey, the peace of God is available unto us all. And that's the next thing I want to look at. The Bible says, uh, Christian then must be patient. Now we're to endure without murmuring. We're to sustain with fortitude. We're supposed to be strong as we go through things. And that's how we grow in patience. Look in Psalm chapter 37. Psalm 37. This is what patience means. Patience means to sustain. It means to endure. It means to put up with something. To be patient. To wait. To be humble enough to, to wait for God to move in your life. That's what patience brings. That's what patience is. Psalm chapter 37 and verse 5 says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the new day. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him that prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. So when we're being attacked, quite often it seems like um, that's just everything. That's just the entirety of our world. We're consumed by it. And, and when we want to respond and we want to lash out, that's us not showing patience. The Bible promises here, it says, evildoers shall be cut off. For yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. The Bible records that you'll even look for them. You'll even seek diligently for the place where they even were in the begin with. But you won't find them. So there is no need. And we're just going to kind of transition from being a brawler to being patient, kind of like a contrasting um, behavior trait. Um, there's no need to be a striker or a brawler. There's no need to be carnal. When you look at what it says here in 37 and verse 8, it says, Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For our evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. So when we're trusting, when we're resting, when we're waiting patiently, when we're not fretting, it's a position that the Christian needs to be. That's a position of, of patience, of long-suffering, of endurance, of sustaining, of standing strong as a fortress would when you're going through some things, when you're going through some strife, some turmoil, some struggles. Psalm chapter 40 and verse 1. Psalm 40 and verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside unto lies. I waited. He inclined. He heard my cry, the Bible says. Waited patiently. And that's what we ought to do as Christians. A Christian then must be patient. It's always better to wait. Look what happens here and just in this little psalm. It says, the Lord put a new song in my heart. The Bible says that blessings are available to those that wait upon the Lord. The Bible says that blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. And when we trust in God, it makes it a whole lot easier to be patient when you're going through strife, when you're going through struggles, when you're going through turmoil, when you're going through low times in your spiritual life. Just be patient. Wait on the Lord. It's always better. He'll give you that new song. He'll encourage your heart. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. You're in Psalms. Go through Proverbs. Ecclesiastes is right after that. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 8. The Bible says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of the fool. So the proud look to their works. They toil. They strive. Uh, they're, they're, they're burdening. They're, in the end, boasting of their great works. But the patient here we see, they wait. They pray. They're sustained by God. They seek God. And in the end, they succeed. What this is highlighting here is, is that the end of a thing is better than the beginning. And if you are patient in spirit as opposed to hasty in spirit, as opposed to proud in spirit, as opposed to fo forward in spirit, you, you will be blessed in the latter end more than in the beginning. Yeah, when you're being a patient person, which the Bible commands Christians to be, you, quite often that beginning portion of a move of God, the beginning portion of a new endeavor, of a new job, of a new uh, chapter in your life, a new season in your life, whatever the next step is, the beginning of that seems rocky, it seems shaky, it seems confusing, it seems scary. But if you are patient, the Bible says better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. You can be assured that whatever you are endeavoring to do, if it be to the glory of God, though it may be struggle right now, though it may be difficult right now, in the end, the latter end of that is always going to be better than the beginning. You can trust in that. Don't be hasty. Don't be proud. Don't be puffed up in the spirit. Don't be, don't be angry. Don't be fighting. Don't be battling always in everything in your life trying to get ahead, but rather sit back. Be patient. Let God move. Be patient in spirit, in that spirit. And God will make great things happen for you. And the latter end will be greater than the beginning. Amen. Look in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. What a God. Amen. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. <clears throat> we know this is the parable of the sower. In Luke chapter 8, and verse 15, we talk about the good ground. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So the Bible says that the fruit of those that are on good ground, where the seed falls on good ground. They are people that receive the word, keep it, they're born again, and they bring forth fruit with patience. If we expect that when we're sowing seed, it's going to land on good ground and instantly spring up and we're just going to have fruit, we're going to be fooled, we're going to be tricked, we're going to be mocked and deceived. No one thinks and expects that that would happen. That's why this is a great illustration. But if we are patient, as the Bible says here, the good ground receiving the seed, with that honest and good heart, having heard the word and then kept the word, so heard the word, received the word, and beheld the word, and, and grabbed hold of it, not going to let go of the word, in due time, the Bible says, with patience, good ground believers will reap. Good ground believers will have fruit to show for it. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 said, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And that's the reality is that in due season, yeah, it's not today. And even though you're sown on good ground, even though it's, it's the best of ground, has lots of nourishment in it, you're in a good church, you're hearing the word of God preached, you're, you're, you're engaged in Bible reading every day, you're praying to God, that good ground, that honest, that good heart is ready and willing and always endeavoring to receive from God what God has for him. If you're impatient, you're going to have nothing to show for it. You're going, to, you're going to fizzle out. You're going to burn out. But if you're patient and you continue in those things, because the Christian life isn't, isn't measured in, in months, isn't measured in weeks, isn't measured in years, isn't measured in, in decades is how the Christian life is measured. If you put in the time, if you have patience, if you wait upon God, if you hear the word and keep it and continue to receive it with that good heart, you will bring forth fruit. And it will be plentiful. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. That's what people who are impatient end up happening. It ends up happening from because they don't see the results right away. And they become weary in the well that they are doing. And when they become weary, they, they faint, they give up, and they miss out on that due season. When if they would have just stuck with it, been patient, they wouldn't have fainted. And they would have had reaping, they would have had fruit to enjoy because of it. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Welcome. Romans chapter 5.
We need to be patient. <clears throat> we also need to be patient, or we also need to be careful when we're praying for exactly that. I don't know if anyone's ever prayed that prayer. Hey, God, give me more patience. Yikes. That's kind of a, a scary prayer to, prayer to pray. Because do you know what patience comes from? Look in Romans chapter 5. Patience, if you look in verse 3, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. So verse 5 there just brings you back to the point where you're like, whew, okay, I'm comforted. The Holy Ghost, the love of God, that's given unto us. But if you want patience in your life, what does the Bible say in verse 3? Tribulation worketh patience. So the the the, the patience is essentially, it's it's brewed, it's it's. It's, uh, it's made on the fertile ground. I don't even know what I wrote here. It's, it's uh, just, just as a, a seed grows up, right? You, you get patience from the fertile ground of tribulation. So if you're somebody that finds themselves impatient, and as a Christian then, we ought to be patient, then when, when we seek after patience, when we want to grow in patience, you know what the Bible is recording here? It says that, that hey, you're going to have tribulation. That's the only way that patience actually grows itself. Because you go into a situation where there is trouble, where there is trial, where there is a need, where there is hurt, where there is strife, where there is confusion, where there is every evil work bearing down upon you, and you're trial, and you're in trouble. But that's where patience has her great work. But be comforted. Romans chapter 15 says, as we just read, the love of God and the Holy Ghost that is given to us will help us when we're in trials. Will it help us when we're growing our patience? Will it help us to have hope in the latter end of those things? Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Patience is, is, is a namesake of God. He is the God of patience. He is the God of consolation. He is the great comforter. And through comfort and hope, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, the Bible says, we can have hope. So because we have the Bible, we can learn patience without having to endure patience, if that makes sense. Quite often, yes, we do have to go through trials and tribulations in order to work patience into our life. And we need to go through those things. But I think we can learn patience a great deal simply by, um, through comfort, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, through reading the scriptures with a patient heart, waiting on God to give you enlightenment, to comfort you through those things. That's where your hope comes from. The God of all patience will give you consolation within those times within those opportunities that you have within his holy word. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And in verse 1 the Bible says, "We then as workers together with him beseech you that also that you receive not the grace of God in vain." And look down in verse 3. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. These are great things that are, are difficult for Christians to go through, but the Christian is to be patient even when you're being afflicted and when you're in necessity, when you're in need of something. When you're distressed and stripes, the Bible says here. How do you do it? Look at verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. There's a key there. By love unfeigned, by the word of truth working in you, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the left hand and on the right, by honor and dishonor, by evil reporting, good report as deceivers, and yet true. Is unknown and yet well known. Here's where God starts to take hold. He, he's exalted in the work of patience in your life. He's exalted when you're going through great trials, tribulations, when you're suffering through some things, when you're laboring, when you're in fastings. God says, and as unknown, and that's the state that I'm in as just a man, and yet well known in the kingdom of God. As dying, and behold, we live. Hey, there's God's resurrection power there. As chastened, and yet not killed, God's going to keep you alive even though you're chastened and beat down. As sorrowful, 
Yet always rejoicing the Holy Spirit working in me to give me that joy of the Holy Ghost. As poor, yet making many rich. Being abound unto so much riches that you can overflow. Because God has put that within you. As having nothing, and yet possessing great things. That's what patience gives us. It gives us the resolve to get to the point where in verse 4 we are having patience tried. We are in afflictions. And yet we can look forward to the point where we are possessing all things, just a few verses down, as God continues to take hold of that situation. Patience allows God to have his perfect work. In Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. One more place, we'll sing it hymn. Revelation 13 and verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb, book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Your patience has an end. The, the, there's no need to be patient when we're in heaven. Even at this point, there's no need to be patient. The patience of the faith, uh, patience of the saints here comes to its full end when God has his judgment, has his right judgment. When God lays down his law and judges righteously those that are not written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the patience and faith of the saints. This is, this is the heartbeat of the saint that is waiting on God. The Bible records that even in heaven there are saints crying, When, Lord, when, Lord, when, Lord, will you judge them? Patient, though, crying out to God for it, it to be imminent, to be now, to have the judgment, because they've seen the perfectness and the purity of God and saw the rebellion of mankind against the living God. They say, when will you judge them? And here's the patience and faith of the saints. When they finally see God's judgment, come to fruition. So we saw here today, a Christian then must be not given to wine. A Christian then must be no striker and not a brawler. A Christian then must be patient. And that has to last to the bitter end. That has to last to the final day when God will finally judge all that don't believe on Him, all that don't call upon Him, cast them forever into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And then we have no need of patience. We have no need of waiting for it. The kingdom is come. Amen. Glory to God. What a day. What a day.